Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of SIF Virtual. Uh, this is another session of interactive case reviews and we have a really, really terrific panel and I think some uh, good case discussion that we're going to uh, that we're going to be having today. I, I'd like to welcome uh, our panel first, as always, uh, my uh, echocardiographer extraordinaire, Dr. Robert Burke, is joining us uh, from Scottsdale. Uh, Dr. Alok Sharma from Minnesota. Dr. Kendra Grubb from Georgia. Dr. Molly Serlip is joining us from Texas. And uh, I've always enjoyed uh, working with Carlos Sanchez from Riverside Methodist in Ohio. He's joined us today. He has a lot of experience uh, with, uh, with the valve uh, platform we're going to be discussing. So group, thank you very much. And I think we'll get right into it. We're going to be having a discussion today uh, this is called Taver Case Review, the Lotus Edge System. And we're going to be having a discussion with some real Taver experts on some of the unique uh, features of the Lotus Edge System. But then we'll show some uh, interesting cases that I think will spark some interesting discussion. For me, I've listed here some of the key design features of the Lotus Edge System. This is a braided nitinol frame with bovine uh, pericardial uh, leaflets. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, real hallmarks of the device is the polyurethane adaptive seal. We'll get into that a little bit more. It deploys by controlled mechanical expansion. And the fact that there is early valve function and rapid pacing is not required allows for hemodynamic stability throughout the deployment of this device. Uh, in my own mind, it gets high marks for the ability to retrieve and reposition this. This is a great example of this, a case we did not long ago. You can see on the left panel that there is a uh, pretty significant uh, height to the valve deployment and it partially incarcerates the left main. Simple retrieval and repositioning allows us to have durable access into the left main coronary artery. Uh, and that's seen on the picture to the right. The polyurethane adaptive seal. Alok Sharma, uh, talk to us about the uh, adaptive seal. Uh, I think it's a great question. Uh, we all know that uh, moderate to severe paravalvular leak is associated with increased mortality. So this, this adaptive seal is a unique feature of the lotus valve. And, and as the valve is being deployed, it uh, fills the gap between the, the annulus and uh, the valve with this multi-layer uh, uh, polymer structure and virtually eliminates the entire uh, uh, paravalvular leak. And uh, we saw that in the Reprise 3 trial, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, the rates of uh, paravalvular leak uh, compared to the core valve or the Evolute R valve were uh, seven times lower with, uh, with the Lotus valve. Uh, and it was, I think, less than 1%. And this is yeah, it, it was that's exactly right. Alok. It was 0.7% at three years. And I think that's one of the unique features of this allowing for durability. And I think those are all great points you've made. Um, uh, I, I'd like to show uh, some some uh, interesting uh, cases. And I'll, I'll throw out some questions to the panel. I want to briefly uh, show uh, some of the uh, some of the recent cases uh, that we uh, have uh, performed. Uh, this is a, a case that we did for Sky 2019. Uh, this is a live case. Uh, in this particular case, we went live at about, I put the timestamps uh, on, uh, on the uh, images. I've inset timestamps. Uh, here's a case where we went live at 2.15. Uh, and by 2.22, uh, we were across the valve and started our deployment. At 225, we have pretty good anchoring of the device. Bob, by 225, you can see pretty uh, pretty uh, solid anchoring. Do you agree? Absolutely. You can see on the uh, TEE that uh, we're not fully deployed yet, but it's anchored nicely in the annulus. And then, Bob, here's the hemodynamics that we noted with this. So again, you can see initially on the biplane imaging that there's really no paravalvular leak. Uh, the image on the left is really at the base of the uh, TAVR, and there's no evidence of leak there. So, Bob, what does this mean as we go forward into the future 
uh, you know, in uh, transcatheter heart valve implantation? Well, what this means for us is that, you know, now that we're getting into low risk patients who are truly low risk, we're really needing to approximate the results of valve replacement to what we would want from a surgical valve, meaning that you want no paravalvular leak and you want really good hemodynamics. And I think we get both of those with this platform uh, more so than anybody else and with the greatest consistency. Carlos, you have some uh, experience with this. I want you to look at the next two cases. Here's a case, a lot of, lot of calcium, and uh, we, we had a pretty significant indentation. Actually, I did this case after I spent time up at your lab because you taught me cerebroembolic protection. You can see we had a lot of calcium in the valve. We use CEP for this. Pretty, pretty significant indentation of the valve. And then we simply did a resheath and a redeployment. And you can see that we got full expansion of the valve. And then not more than a week later, uh, this complex uh, bicuspid anatomy, you can see the baseline gradients, a real, real classic uh, looking uh, uh, bicuspid anatomy with heavy calcification. Again, a pretty serious indentation of the valve uh, leaflet uh, or I'm sorry, of the valve of the braid frame. And so what we did is we simply resheathed and redeployed and we got a very nicely expanded uh, device. Talk to us about your experience with this. Yeah, uh, you know, the, the potential of mechanical valvuloplasty with this technology is amazing. And I think it's a feature that should be used. And remember, there is no concern about it because a leaflet's really are not sewn uh, into the braid, uh, braid frame of the valve, uh, but more to the posts. So that's, that's, that's an important uh, feature uh, when you see deformation. Uh, does that gonna affect the valve function? You always people say, well, is that gonna increase your gradient? Is that gonna affect the valve function? And the answer is no. And the reason is be because of uh, what I mentioned, the leaflets are not attached to the braid frame of the valve. And that's an, something important to understand about this technology. All right, so let's show the case, uh, the featured case for this session. And um, it, it always seems, uh, in my experience, that your sickest patients uh, present you on Friday about uh, six o'clock uh, Arizona time. And this, this case is, is no exception. This is a patient who presented in cardiogenic shock, a 78-year-old morbidly obese female in congestive heart failure, renal failure, and she was hypotensive. You can see her creatinine and GFR are both impaired. Uh, she presented uh, in the uh, early evening hours. She was transferred immediately to the intensive care unit. Physical exam, she was hypotensive. She was, she, we noted a sinus tachycardia and there were rals on physical exam halfway up the lung fields. She also had a three over six late peaking holosystolic murmur, sort of a classic murmur of aortic stenosis. She was transferred to the ICU Bob Burke, what are you seeing here? So again, we're seeing a pretty calcified trileaflet valve here. Um, STJ looks calcified, maybe a little bit small. Okay, and so after transferring her to the unit, she continued to deteriorate. And so what we did uh, uh, over the course of the first 12 hours is we took her to the cardiac catheterization laboratory to place a mechanical circulatory support. She remained pretty hypotensive. Kendra, talk to us about the use of uh, mechanical circulatory support. You can see her coronary arteries. You can see the heights, the coronary heights, we eventually learned are, are, are pretty low. And in this particular case, uh, we placed uh, a, an Impella CP device. Kendra, are you guys doing this with any kind of frequency? And talk to us about uh, what this means. So we, we do, um, I wouldn't say with any type of frequency, these are always really tough cases for us um, because you have the initial resuscitation and then you also have to relieve the mechanical obstruction of the aortic valve. Um, and so oftentimes this is a patient that we would end up probably going straight to the valve and, and seeing if we could just open up the valve and then see what, what our hemodynamics were and then potentially use mechanical support afterward. So in other words, maybe you do a valvuloplasty 
and then uh, place uh, your uh, your Impella device or whatever. Uh, exactly. Support. Okay. Okay. Molly, what's your experience with this? Um, that's pretty much the same thing too. I think we would typically probably do a valvuloplasty first and then place the support if needed. Um, we've had a lot of good results with valvuloplasty, but you could definitely do the Impella as well. And, and that's that's what we did. We um, she was pretty hypotensive and rapid pacing. We were reluctant to do that. And I've actually had uh, Bob Burke and I have had a good experience. And and, and when Dr. Sharma was uh, with us in Arizona, we tended to go directly to MCS without valvuloplasty. Though I don't think there's uh, a perfectly perfect answer. Whenever we use MCS, uh, we do put a swan in. Uh, and uh, we placed a swan gans catheter in this patient. And, and so over the course of the next 48 hours, we saw some improvement in hemodynamics stabilization. We were able to effectively uh, diurese this patient. So uh, Bob Burke and I sat down uh, along with our surgeon, uh, Dr. Bob Riley, and we, we asked ourselves, what's our next step? We, we were of the impression that this patient probably wasn't going to wean off MCS. So Bob did a transesophageal echocardiogram and did some really, really nice uh, echocardiographic measurements. And what we learned uh, from his measurements is that the coronary heights were both low. Uh, uh, the, the left coronary height was about, uh, was about six. And um, what, uh, what we also uh, confirmed was the severity of aortic stenosis. So uh, we made the decision to proceed with TAVR. Bob, any, any other comments about uh, sort of our pre-procedural planning on this? Um, you know, it was different. We typically use CT as our primary imaging modality, but with her kidney failure and everything else, we were trying to avoid that. So that's why we went ahead with the TEE for valve sizing and also looking at coronary heights. So um, we decided uh, to protect uh, the coronaries. Molly, uh, what's your modality of choice if you're going to protect the coronaries? What do you do at, uh, at the time of your procedure? Um, if we protect the coronaries, what we do now is um, we put a guide in and we use actually a guide liner. We used to go ahead and put a stent down, but now just using the guide liner and leaving the guide liner in um, as opposed to the... Uh, um, uh, guide catheter, and uh, uh, and that's pretty much how we uh, uh, protect the coronaries. If we're going to protect the coronaries like this, otherwise we would do basilica. Alok, we had completely separate ostia. These we had two, two. There is the LED and the cert came off uh, separately. So we used uh, double wires, uh, one down the LED, one down the cert, and we initially, as you can see. Uh, put uh, balloons down each. Anything else you might do here, Carlos? I'm sorry, Alok. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I think uh, these are always challenging uh, cases when the ostium are separate, but uh, uh, as long as uh, if the sinuses are phased, I think the risk of coronary obstruction is, is uh, pretty high, especially with low STJ. So I, I, I think that's what I would do. So balloon both the uh, both the LED and the circumflex and be ready with stents. Uh, Carlos, anything to add? No, I think uh, I would protect exactly like you're doing, uh, Dave. I would put two wires and have a balloon down. You, it's difficult to use a guide liner here. Obviously, you have a unique dual protection, so you can't really go. But I totally agree with Molly that we, we also use a guide liner, and I think it is important to, uh, to use one. But here you have no options to go with two wires. Kendra, I thought that if we were going to have coronary obstruction, I wanted something that uh, something that we could retrieve and reposition. Do you agree with that, or no? That's that's we, we you've had great success with balloon expandables in, in these types of cases. No, I think that um, I think your thinking is correct that you could precisely land and make sure that your coronary ostia was not involved. Um, so I think a, a retrievable valve or repositional valve is the way to go. Okay. So this is, we, we um, actually uh, 
uh, implanted uh, at a depth that we uh, that we thought appropriate. And a lot of a lot of good transesophageal echocardiographic imaging. Um, at this point, the wires are going over the lotus braid frame. We implanted the lotus. Bob did some great interrogation. We had no PVL. Interestingly, she remained hemodynamically stable throughout. But you can see what Steve Yakubov, uh, the term he coined, the, the white line of death, if you will, um, you can see that white line, which is indicative of coronary obstruction. You can see it in the dynamic movement on the left and in the still frame on the right. And I've uh, outlined that with the red arrows. There is flow into these uh, separate ostia coronary, but uh, the flow is, is rather limited. I was surprised that she remained so hemodynamically stable. So we had to think about what we would do. Uh, we kept, we, we always had the opportunity or the choice to, to retrieve the valve. But since the patient was hemodynamically stable, we, we tried to think of something else to do. Um, again, good dynamic pictures showing uh, the obstruction and that so-called white line indicative of obstruction. So what we did over the course of the next few minutes was to surrender the circ wire and actually uh, maintaining the wire over the braid frame and into the LAD, we then advanced the guide catheter within the boundaries of the Lotus device and then through, right through the braid frame, uh, passed the wire into the LAD. We then passed a second wire through the braid frame into uh, the left circumflex. So now at this point, we have two wires going through the braid frame, no wires going over the braid frame, but two wires going through the braid frame, one into the LAD and one into the circumflex. We performed a kissing balloon angioplasty, which really didn't push the leaflets aside. And then we performed V stenting, a pretty standard V stenting uh, procedure. Uh, Alok, would you have done anything different at this point? No, I mean, I, I think uh, you probably sometimes need two stents for these because uh, the leaflet and uh, the braid and nitronol frame uh, can uh, compress the, the stents as well. So, and with the separate ostium, I, I, I think uh, V stent is probably the right thing to do. Carlos? Dave, a very fascinating case. I wonder if, uh, if once you have the wires before deploying the valve or releasing the valve, uh, you try to pull the wires and see if there was a hemodynamic instability to, to, to later just recapture the valve quick uh, to see if it was truly a, a, you know, occlusion of the coronary arteries. I, you know, I didn't. And I think that would have been a very, very reasonable option was just to retrieve, uh, retrieve the valve. But at this point, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I was sort of committed. And so, uh, and I got the wires through the braid frame so easily that I felt comfortable that what we would be able to do is step through the braid frame. The wires actually went through, you know, I had heard you cannot uh, wire balloon stent through the braid frame of a Lotus. Uh, and, and this was way easier than I thought. And given her hemodynamic stability, I thought it's worth a try. And if she ever got hemodynamically unstable, we would, we would retrieve. Uh, Kendra, uh, foolhardy of me or a worth a try? Oh, I think it's worth a try. Molly? Yeah, I just have a question. Was it hard to get the uh, the NC balloons across? Molly, therein lies the biggest surprise to me of this case, and maybe the perfect question. They went right through. Mm -hmm. Now, you can see down near the annulus and down near the, the adaptive seal that Alok talked about, that marker uh, down low at the at the base of the annulus, that's the top of the polyurethane seal. You can see there's braid bunching there. And if there's braid bunching there, there's going to be sort of wide open cells, if you will, at the top. So maybe that aided in being able to get the wires 
and the balloons across. Now, Bob, you were you were watching the LV. You had a TE probe down. You were watching the LV. You kept reassuring me that we're not having any LV dysfunction or uh, echocardiographic hemodynamic changes. Yeah, she did great throughout. Okay, so now we have kissing stents in, and then we did kissing, uh, kissing a final kissing balloon angioplasty. And now that white line that we talked about, that's so indicative of, of, uh, of uh, coronary incarceration, that's gone. Bob, you want to talk about what you saw hemodynamically? Again, hemodynamically, the valve was functioning beautifully throughout all of this. And again, had no problems whatsoever with any PVL. Would anybody have done anything different at this time? I, I think, uh, like uh, uh, Kendra mentioned, I think upfront basilica might be an option here, uh, but but I think we did not have the CT scan. But uh, uh, but I think th th this is this is great result. Uh, I just uh, I just don't know the the long term durability. But how how old is she? She's seventy eight. Mm -hmm. yeah. But so, I, I think it, uh, that, I mean, that, 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 there was nothing else that could have uh, been done after the, uh, the leaflet occluded the coronaries. So this was my first experience, and I think the first nationwide experience with, uh, with uh, a worldwide experience with plastying through uh, the braid frame. And as uh, things usually work out, not a week later, we had a second case almost the exact same thing. This one was a bit of a surprise because these were 12 millimeter height uh, coronaries, at least by CT. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see we had a, uh, uh, we had a, that, that white line again, indicative of coronary obstruction. And in this particular case, what made this case different is I actually went through the braid frame after uh, we deployed uh, the, the valve, not, not before, uh, we didn't have, we weren't protected. And I actually put a guidezilla, a guide extension catheter. Uh, you can see I'm showing it here. The guidezilla went through spectacularly easily. And then we ballooned, uh, we stented, put a 4.0 DES in, and then a 4.5 non-compliant balloon. And you can see our final result on the left, the pre, uh, where you have obstruction of the coronary, and on the right, post after stenting, where we really don't have obstruction. And now you can see by intravascular ultrasound from about oh o'clock to what ten or eleven o'clock that the braid frame uh, of of the uh, of the uh, Lotus uh, device. Give me some feedback on this. How might you have done this better? Uh, how might you have done this differently? I I'm curious. Because now we, you know, Kendra, your point was a retrievable device can uh, probably works better or is a good choice or is a reasonable choice. But now having done this twice in a, you know, a span of like seven or 10 days, we're pretty comfortable doing this. And we've done it one more time with good success with the Lotus device. Give me some feedback. Is it worth considering this as a, a frontline device for this? I, I think that um, my con biggest concern is not what's going to happen in the initial 30 days, but what happens over time. On um, some of these snorkel stents that we've seen, um, and especially in a bailout situation, they end up thrombosing later, they end up having early um, instant restenosis, and whether that's compression from the outer portion of the, the leaflet that's in, in uh, partially impinging, or if it's actually the stent frame, um, I don't think we totally understand. So I think as a bailout, this is an excellent way to get yourself out of a problem. But I think from you know my standpoint, and certainly at Emory, if we have the CT to begin with, we're going to try to pre-plan this. And if we're at all concerned, although you have a leaflet height that's 12, oh, excuse me, coronary height that's 12, we are making sure that the leaflet height's not 14. You may need a basilica in a native because the leaflet height is still too long. So our strategy is a little bit different at Emory. Molly, anything you'd do differently or any other considerations? 
Uh, well, I actually second what Kendra said. Um, we actually measure the leaflet length now too, because we've had this happen to us before where the coronary heights seem to be high, but the leaflet lengths are higher and cause obstruction. Um, I can honestly say we've never wired through a, a lotus valve, so I'm glad that you did it first. So, uh, because I think it's a very cool technique and something that we uh, can do um, in the future. We too try to do maybe basilica um, if there's, if we know uh, beforehand that there's going to be a problem, but this is a pretty uh, nice way if you get caught um, without uh, knowing uh, about it. Carlos, one of the things um, that I, that I've, I've tried to emphasize about Lotus Edge, um, every time we go to a, a course or a live case demonstration, it seems like it's a bicuspid that is uh, that they use Lotus Edge. They, they, Lotus Edge is picked for the most complex anatomy. Bob Burke and I are of the impression that, it, as we showed in that live case last year from Sky, that it's really, really good in simple anatomy. Kind of share with me your experience. I agree, Dave. I think it's more of a fear and lack of understanding of a completely new technology for, for many people. And then, and then you look at the data and obviously the data, it's not very supportive from a pacemaker rate. So people are very comfortable with, uh, with Sapien valve and Evolute valve, which is a very mature technology. And now you're, you have a brand new technology that you're not, it's not like a stent that you expand the stent the same way. You have to learn the nuances of, of the new technology. But I 100% agree with you, Dave. That that you know, with good practice, this valve is is safe. It's you, you can get your pacemaker rates down, and uh, and you have the advantages also that is uh, is mechanically expanded and fully recapturable if you need it. Bob Burke, he said pacemaker rates. The pacemaker rates uh, for the pivotal approval trial. Uh, uh, you know, they were substantial. Our pacemaker rates now with Lotus Edge are in about the 15% range. Uh, some may say that's still high. Is there a, a worthwhile trade-off pacemaker rates of 15% uh, versus what we see with PVL, which is virtually zero in the majority of our cases? Yeah, we really don't see any paravalvular leak with the use of Lotus Edge, which, you know, like I was saying earlier, this begins to approximate, at least from the functional standpoint, the success that you would anticipate with a surgical valve, where if there's any PVL postoperatively, that's really abnormal. I mean, I'm sure that Kendra and Molly would really look twice if they saw PVL following implanting a, a surgical valve. So I think that as we go to these lower risk patients, we really have to try to achieve those kind of results and hopefully with better hemodynamics and really good durability. You know, that's what we're really looking for here. And that's generally what we achieve with the use of Lotus Edge. Uh, before we started this session, Bob and I were in a Taver case. We did a 25 millimeter Lotus Edge on a 78 or 79 year old uh, female patient. And the surgeon, it was his uh, first or second Lotus implant, Alok. And the surgeon said, you know, there's, there's more of a learning curve uh, to this. Alok, you're very fortunate in that early on, after you graduated uh, from fellowship, you walked into uh, enrollment in the pivotal approval trial. Talk to us about the learning curve uh, associated with, with Lotus Edge. I know that's a loaded question, but tell us what your learning curve experience was. Yeah, I, I think I was very fortunate to be a, a part of the reprise trial uh, being in Arizona with you. Uh, and I think everything has a learning curve, whether it's whether it's the Evolute or Core Valve or it's Edwards. Uh, I think the uh, the key is understanding the, the valve design and, and how it operates. And I think that makes it easier to understand uh, and uh, shortens the learning curve. But I, I think uh, four to five cases is, is enough, in my uh, opinion, to, to be uh, really good at it. Kendra, I'm going to give you the final word before I give my closing comments. I think this was a great case. Um, certainly, um, at Emory, we aren't doing very many of these valves. 
Um, we have, uh, you know, tried to figure out who to use these valves on. And I think you bring up some excellent points that it is really a valve that we, we can have at our disposable, uh, disposal, excuse me, for, um, you know, regular patients. We don't have to be looking for the very most, most challenging anatomies, ones that are not appropriate for an S3 or an Evolute and then use it in those cases. And so I, I think that it's a, it's a good time to have a third valve choice and we can really start drilling down on what's the right valve for this particular patient and this patient's anatomy. Yeah, that, I, think those are, I think that's a great uh, comment and I, I completely agree with you. For me, and uh, I, I'm a little conflicted, I was honored to have been the uh, co-PI for the US uh, pivotal approval trial with Michael Reardon. Um, we have a lot of experience with this valve. I think as we go forward into the future, uh, from where I sit, there are going to be a lot of new uh, intermediate experience operators, uh, kind of uh, uh, combining what everybody has said do I think that Aloka's right? The learning curve is five to 10 cases. I completely agree with that. Do I believe that this is first line valve therapy? I do. And actually for me, the simplicity uh, of the deployment of this valve is such that after uh, experience with five or 10 cases, I think this is something that the intermediate level operators, this whole new crop of operators who, who are getting into TAVR, can pull this off the shelf, understanding that if I'm doing this in a low risk patient, I'm going to have really excellent PVL rates. If uh, if the early commercial experience is uh, is instructive, you're going to have pacemaker rates about in the 15% range, uh, and that uh, I can deploy this with uh, simplicity and with durable uh, PVL rates. So. For me, uh, I think this is a, a first line device. I, I think it's a great device. I think this has been a great, uh, great uh, conversation and a great case review. Obviously, we showed something that was a little bit more complex and required a little bit more thought. I would like to thank our panel of experts for joining us for, inter, uh, for the uh, Scottsdale Interventional Forum virtual and for these interactive case reviews. Th this was a... Uh, a discussion by some real superstar uh, uh, TAVR experts. And uh, we welcome you to uh, join us live and in person uh, for March 10th through the 13th, 2021, uh, Scottsdale Interventional Forum at the Hyatt Ganey Ranch in Scottsdale. Thank you very much uh, for joining us, doctors.